Good evening. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, tonight, we have our webinar all about native plants for birds. And we have Michelle Saren back to join us. If you were with us last week, we talked all about how to make a bird friendly space and talked a little bit about native plants. So tonight, we'll get more into that. Uh, my name is Sarah Housen. I am the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon. We are an organization dedicated to fostering the appreciation and conservation of birds and the environment that we share. We could not do the work we do without our funders and our members, and I wanted to make sure to thank all of you who are members or supporting projects like these. Some quick Zoom housekeeping before we begin today. You're able to control your video and microphone in the bottom left of your screen. We ask that you keep yourself muted so that we do not receive feedback from your microphones. You can see closed captioning today by clicking on live transcript on the bottom of your screen. You can also open the chat box by clicking on the chat button on the bottom of your screen. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation, so please add any questions you might have to the chat. We are also recording the webinar today and it will be shared via email in the next week or two, and you can also find it on the Detroit Audubon YouTube channel. If you have any further questions, please reach out to me and I will do my best to assist you. Michelle Saren is a native plant enthusiast and a Wayne State student and Detroit Audubon's go-to when it comes to native plants. Thank you and welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much, Sarah. Uh, welcome everyone. I get to talk about my passion tonight, so thank you for being here with me. I'm going to turn my audio off to save bandwidth on my end. Um, so you can enjoy the slides. So here we go. All right, so I got into uh, using native plants for birds about 20 years ago. Uh, we bought a half an acre in Roseville and I wanted to wildscape it to attract wildlife like birds and provide a safe haven for them. So that's a little bit about how I got started in all of this. Um, I was a naturalist for the Metro Parks and a few other uh, local area nature centers for about 16 years. I've done a lot of talks about native plants in a variety of locations. Currently, I'm a student at Wayne State University and transitioned back from my job here at Wayne State into my first love, which is plants and wildlife. So that's what I've been spending my time doing. A little bit about my backyard in Roseville. After we had wildscaped it, we had a little prairie area, a little woodland area, a pond, a vegetable garden. And in the course of 18 years, I saw 75 different species in that backyard, including scarlet tanager, American woodcock, indigo bunting, and at least 15 species of warblers. So the takeaway from that and our takeaway from tonight is if you plant it, they will come. So we're going to do our bit for birds. If you're flying overhead and you're a bird and you pass over an urban or suburban area, this is pretty much what you see. This does not look very inviting for most birds. There's a little bit of greenery there, some trees to hang out in, but those lawns don't offer a whole lot of protection from predators or weather, nor very much food. So we're gonna try and see if we can amend some of that with our own spaces, whether we have a yard, um, a place up north, or even just a balcony, we can do this. And we all know that Birds are in decline, especially some of our grassland species. And the number one reason for that is habitat loss. Um, we are working on building some of these corridors now for birds, but every little household and backyard counts. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight and focus on. So as you can see here, a lot of the losses have come among the smaller songbirds, um, the ones we'd like to see so much, like this beautiful Baltimore Oriole or Northern Oriole. Um, bringing those species back is a matter of providing things in different places at different times. So here in Michigan, we can't do much for the migratory species that overwinter in areas south of here, but we can do stuff for them during migratory season, providing some roadside assistance as it were, or a, a kind of a park for them to stop in, catch a snack, get a rest, and be on their way. Some will stop in the area for breeding 
And then we have our winter residents as well and our all year long birds like cardinals and chickadees. So we've got to think about those different birds and what they need and when they need it. This is not what they need. There's just not much here. Ecologically, this is a pretty dead space. On top of which, we have a tendency to maintain our lawns with a lot of chemicals. Um, mowing the lawn, of course, we tend to use fossil fuels, which is not helping the climate issue any. And grass doesn't really serve any other ecological functions either. When we start getting into things like native plants, they need less maintenance, not zero maintenance. If you ever hear that anywhere, that's not true. They still need to be somewhat maintained, but once they get established, you don't have to water them as much. They shouldn't need any pesticides or fertilizers and their deep root systems allow them to withstand drought, um, our crazy weather here in Michigan, which we are all experiencing this spring. And also then do things like mitigate stormwater. But what we're gonna talk about tonight is the ecological service they provide for wildlife, particularly birds. Now I'm not saying get rid of your lawn. We all need some space to walk around, hang out with our friends, have the kids play soccer, let the dog run. But it's nice to take the spaces that you're not using and transform them into a more natural looking area. And we're gonna be talking about that tonight, how you can do that in different places in your yard, whether they're sunny or shady, wet or dry with native plants. So the first thing you need to think about when you're choosing native plants for birds is, well, figuring out what the birds need. Like all living things, they need the basics, food, water, shelter, and space. We're gonna be talking about the food stuff, but just to make sure that we've got everything else covered, um, if you can provide a source of water, that's important. Doesn't have to be a pond like this one from my old backyard. Um, I live in Detroit now, so I don't have this backyard anymore but I still have a shallow pan of water that I put out that I keep clean and I change um, as often as I can and keep the pan clean. If at all possible to make that water a year round source for the birds is important. So a heater of some sort or some kind of bubbler to keep the water open is great if you can manage it. Shelter, you don't have to have birdhouses. Um, shrubs like this arborvitae or white cedar provide year round shelter for birds from the weather and predators and can also provide some nesting spaces for birds. This chickadee here is using um, an old tree with some holes in it. They may have come from woodpeckers or just rotting out. So some of the birds will use natural cavities in some of these spaces. Other birds of course will use trees or shrubs to nest in and some actually nest on the ground. So you can provide spaces like that. And then you have to think about, well, what kind of habitat can your yard support? Um, if you have a big space, maybe you can have a wooded area. If you have a small space, maybe something more like a small grassland. And then of course, you have to know which birds are in your area and what they need. Um, some are here year round, like our chickadees and our cardinals, and even some of our robins. Some just pass through this area during migratory season in the spring and fall. We're lucky here in Michigan in the Great Lakes region. We're a crossover point for two major migratory flyways, the Atlantic Flyway and the Mississippi Flyway. So we have a lot of birds coming through here, going to their northern breeding grounds, looking for a place to stop and get a bite to eat and rest for a little while. We do have some that stay here in the summer and breed in our area like hummingbirds. And then we actually have some that come down south here for the winter like dark-eyed juncos. So if you're interested in particular birds, it's a good idea to look them up, see when they're here in your area and find out what they need. So what exactly do birds eat? Now, when I ask kids this question, their first answer is worms. Um, no, most birds aren't designed to eat worms. Worms are in the ground. Birds have little beaks. They can't get them out of the ground. And a bird's beak tells you basically what the bird's capable of eating. That woodcock at the top, now there's a bird that can eat worms. That long bill is adapted to poking into the ground and getting those worms out. But that little hummingbird, even though it has a long bill, it's not designed for that. That's for poking into those 
deep tubular flowers flicking out that little tongue and getting the nectar from the inside of the flowers. Birds like this sparrow in the middle with that sharp, heavy conical beak are capable of cracking open seeds. But the little warbler down here in the lower right, that tiny beak, no, nope, that's not going to manage that. That's for picking insects along branches, under leaves, all over the place, wherever you can find them. That's what that little bird does. This nightjar here on the right, that tiny beak opens to a much wider mouth. And when that bird is on the wing, those little bristles around the edge of the beak help to funnel flying insects into that mouth when that bird takes flight in the evenings. The woodpecker, of course, here on our left, that beak and that head, that whole body is designed for drilling into the trees and that tongue has a little barb on the end. So when it goes into that tree trunk and stabs those insects and pulls them back out, that woodpecker's got a great meal. Our raptor here on the bottom has that sharp pointed beak for ripping and tearing flesh. And then the grackle in the middle has what we call a generalist beak. It's pretty tough, so it can eat seeds, it can crack some open. It's sharp and pointy enough to go picking up insects. So that bird has a wider variety of foods that it can eat. But for the most part, birds are specialists and not generalists. So we have to think about the foods that we're providing for them. And native plants can do a lot of that. These animals and their food needs have co-evolved over time. And the mutual relationship with one another. So the bird will get food or like this goldfinch nesting material, but they also provide a service for the plants. This hummingbird's going to help to pollinate this cardinal flower because when it sticks its head down into that tubular space and gets its beak in there, you'll see the anthers on this flower are positioned so they brush pollen onto the hummingbird's head. This goldfinch on the left, not only is it getting nesting material from that thistle down, but in the process, it's spreading the thistle seeds. And the timing of these events is just right. So in the fall, when hummingbirds are migrating, jewelweed is in bloom. I always call that McDonald's for hummingbirds because there it is, ready for them to get what they need. So these coevolutionary processes have adapted between these native plants and the birds that rely on them, as well as some of the other wildlife that we'll talk about. And that timing is essential. That's not something non-native plants have in a relationship with our wildlife. So I keep talking about native plants. What, what is a native plant? The standard definition is that a native plant is one that was present in this region prior to European settlement. How do we know what was here? A couple ways. One thing is that we have some remnant areas that were not put under the plow by agriculture or logged. So we can actually look at these small ecosystem patches and see what's still there. The other thing that we can do is make use of the Michigan Natural Features Inventory website. And I'll provide a link to that at the end of the presentation. When you get this, you can actually click on this map and go to that site. But MNFI took survey records from the early 1800s here in Michigan. And those records were as people walked mile transects and ranges, and they took copious notes as to what they were seeing because they wanted to attract settlers here and they wanted to attract businesses like logging and farming. So they really needed to know what they were looking at so they could plot all this out and sell these parcels of land. MNFI took those records and tried to reconstruct what habitats were probably in each county in Michigan. So you can look up your county look at the colors represented in your county and actually pinpoint the area that you might live in. Look at the checklist on the right in the key and anything that's got a check next to it is one of the habitats that's pictured um, in the map. Now, can we actually reconstruct that? Probably not. Um, these purple sections here in Wayne County were Lake Plain Prairie. Most of that area is now suburb and we probably can't re construct it because we don't let those areas flood anymore like they would have traditionally. But we can get an idea of the plants that are adapted to the soil and climate conditions that are in that part of the state. 
So that's what we're going to aim for when we talk about native plants. So here's the uh, website for the Michigan Natural Features Inventory. You'll notice they have a, a number of things up at the top. So um, in, in resources, they have their pre-settlement vegetation maps where you can look at your county and see what was there. And then once you figure out what kind of habitats you're looking at for your area, you can go to the Natural Communities link and take a look at each of those in detail. And they will give you a list of the plants in that community. So you know not only what could grow there, but what grows companionably with one another. These plants don't grow in isolation. They grow in communities with one another and they're adapted to be together. If you have a black walnut, you may have trouble growing things underneath it. But black walnut's a native plant here in Michigan. And we have many native species of wildflowers and other plants that are adapted to grow in concert with black walnuts. So what native plants provide for birds? Well, four main food groups. Uh, this is not like our main food groups, of course. These are the bird main food groups and what they get from plants. Primarily insects, which we'll talk about in depth. Berries and fruits for those birds adapted to eating them. Seeds and nuts for the birds that have those thick beaks that can crack those things open. And nectar and sap for a few specialized species. So let's start out with insects. Who eats insects? Most of our small songbirds eat insects, not only as adults, but to feed their babies. Over 90% of most baby birds are fed caterpillars. Caterpillars are rich in nutritious food source, high in protein and a lot of minerals. Um, someday if we find ourselves not being able to farm as much and have meat on the hoof, we may be resorting to eating insects. It's not as bad as it sounds. I've tried it. A lot of other cultures do it too, but birds are really good at it. That's a primary food source for many of them. And they get it in different ways. They may glean like this little yellow warbler or look in the undergrowth like the wren. They could peck at the wood and get insects that are under the bark like a woodpecker. Or our two on the right, our flycatcher and our chimney swift take to the air and catch insects on the wing. So we want to have plants that are there for these insects. That includes plants that host their offspring, their larva. Most of us have heard about milkweed for monarchs and we need the milkweed for monarchs because monarch caterpillars, all they'll eat are monarch plant or milkweed plants, that's their host. They're very host specific. That's true for a lot of butterflies and moths and their caterpillars are what are feeding our adult birds and again, primarily our baby birds. So we want to plant those things that those insects can use for their larva. For those that eat nectar and pollen, and that's not just bees and wasps, that's also small flies, um, our butterflies and moths, and beetles, ants, a lot of insects take nectar and pollen from flowers. So we want to plant things that provide those food sources for those insects. Um, deadwood is an interesting thing because a lot of insects will be in there um, in the rotting bark and in the tree, making use of the nutrients that are there. And again, birds like this woodpecker can find them. And very importantly, especially in the fall, the leaf litter. Leaving it on the ground does several things. First of all, there are a lot of insects that will use that space. Um, to find food through the year, but also as an overwintering space because those leaves provide a nice warm blanket for them. And that includes the pupa or the cocoons of some of our butterfly and moth species. Those birds know to find those insects and other invertebrates there. So they'll go hunting in the leaf litter for them. One of my favorite things to do in the spring was to go into my backyard during migratory season and watch the leaves just fly through the air as the grackles and thrashers were back there picking them up and tossing them all over the place looking for insects and other invertebrates below them. Then of course the leaf litter will also decompose and put those nutrients back into the soil. So those are very important aspects of plants that are good for insects that will support all these different types of birds and their offspring. There have been studies about which species actually host the most insects. Um, some of you may be familiar with Doug Tallamy and Bringing Nature Home and some of, some of his other works. 
correct or not, he's an entomologist from New Jersey, and he has extensively studied trees and how they best host different caterpillar species. So here is his top list of, bird, of tree species, it's top nine, and how many different species of butterfly and moth caterpillars these plants support. Oak tree, if you plant an oak tree, it's an amazing source of food and not just for butterfly and moth caterpillars, but a lot of other insects as well. If you can't plant something as big as an oak, you can go for something smaller like a willow or a cherry tree. Whatever is good for your region and your space. But at least one tree is a good way to start because of all of the insects that they can host. That's as opposed to our non-native species. Ginkgos are great city trees. They can tolerate pollution, but they're not native. They're from Asia. And after all of the time that they've been here in North America, they still only support five species of caterpillar. That's just not enough for our birds and their babies. So big plug is plant things for bugs. Holes and leaves are good. That means the bugs are eating your plants. But you also want to plant natives for other sources of food for birds. And one of the easiest ones to do are plants for seeds. Who's eating those seeds? Well, these birds with those big, thick, conical beaks, our sparrows, finches, and our gross beaks like this cardinal. What are the plants they need the best? I'm going to provide you with a longer list after this. Um, you'll get that resource emailed to you if you've signed up for the webinar. But I'm going to pick out for each of these sections my top four types of plants so that you can kind of focus in on those for whatever space that you have available. First of all, plants for seeds. We have a lot of native grasses. Some are quite small, others a bit taller. My favorite one is this one pictured here. This is Indian grass. And you can see those golden wavy flower heads and later seed head. Um, it's a beautiful plant. It's a clump grass, so it's not going to spread too much by rhizomes like turf grass would or some weedy grasses. You can keep it in nice, neat, decorative clumps. Um, it will self sow, so you might get some baby grasses coming up. But in the fall, sparrows love to eat those seeds, and a lot of our native sparrows are migrating. So they'll stop by, balance on those very delicate um, seed heads and just pluck those seeds off. Watching house sparrows do the same thing is really funny because some of the house sparrows are bigger than our native sparrows and those seed heads just bend all the way down to the ground. So it's kind of fun to watch them. If you have a big enough space, Grasses like this Indian grass, again, a clump grass, can also provide nesting habitat for ground nesting birds like song sparrows. So it's got a double benefit, seeds for food and a nesting place for ground nesting birds. You may be familiar with coneflowers. That's pushed a lot, especially purple coneflower as a great seed source for birds, but there are lots of different coneflowers that fall into these three main uh, genera. So when you're looking at plants, it's really good to know the scientific name because there are a lot of common names that we use for the same things over and over. So we're familiar with echinacea. That's our purple coneflower. Um, there's some debate about whether or not purple coneflower is actually native to Michigan, but we definitely have some native species of echinacea, including pale purple coneflower. Um, those heads are kind of spiky when they produce seeds, kind of tough for the birds to get at. These two other groups, the Rudbeckia, which we typically know as black-eyed Susans, but there are other coneflowers in that group as well, and Retibida, which is our cut-leafed or green-headed coneflower, also produce seeds. Pictured here on the right is yellow-headed or prairie coneflower, also called gray-headed coneflower. This is a goldfinch magnet. You'll notice it doesn't have that spikiness like the purple coneflower does. Those seeds come off quite easily. They're good size. They provide a lot of nutrition. And the goldfinches just strip them bare. A lot of us will put sunflowers in our bird feeders, but we have native sunflowers as well. They don't have the big heads that the non-native sunflowers have, 
but then they're not as attractive to squirrels either. And there are native sunflowers that grow in wet areas, dry areas, sun, and partial shade. Um, some of them can get fairly aggressive and spread, so you have to be careful with some of them. And they get quite tall, but they are a good food source producing seeds in late summer and early fall. And then finally, our tick seeds or coreopsis range anywhere from very short sand coreopsis, which uh, will be blooming here shortly and produce seeds in early to midsummer, another goldfinch favorite, to the taller, tall coreopsis, um, which will produce seeds later in the year. So you've got a whole variety of plants here that produce seeds. Now, the important part about seed producers is leaving those seed heads through the fall and early winter. I don't remove my dead vegetation until this time of the year because not only are they providing food for um, birds, but they're also providing shelter for the insects that the birds are looking for. So if you can leave some of that vegetation up, um, if you need to make it a little tidier, cut it to about 18 inches, but try and leave those flower heads up as long as you can so they can provide that food source for birds and shelter for overwintering insects. All right. Next on our list, we have nuts. Now nuts are quite a bit larger, so not as many birds use them. Um, you'll see this blue jay here with that egg corn. Blue jays will cache those egg corns, store them, and they will remember where they put every single one. They will also watch squirrels and remember where the squirrels put them when the squirrels forget because the squirrels don't remember where they put them. They We'll go and look for them, smell for them, dig up your lawn and everything else in the area looking for them. But the blue jays actually remember where those caches are and will use them liberally through the winter. Nuthatches will also eat some of our small nuts from uh, trees like beech. And then if you have an area with grouse and turkeys, uh, mast, which is the abundance of nuts that trees like oaks produce uh, periodically over a span of years. That's an important food source for them. So if you can plant the trees that produce nuts, that's great, but they're all the small plants that are good for backyards. And my favorite one among them is the hazelnut. Hazelnut is a large shrub. It's got beautiful foliage all through the year and then produces hazelnuts, which we can eat as well. Uh, if you grow it though, you aren't gonna get a chance because the animals will get to it long before you do. So hazelnut is my top choice for small yards if you're looking for a plant that produces nuts. Oaks, of course, also produce acorns and there are many different species of oaks for different conditions. Some grow quite fast, like the chinkapin oak. Others are much slower but they're worth investing in. And as we mentioned earlier, they're also the top tree for butterfly and moth caterpillars. Our native maples produce these helicopters or keys or samaras, and they're eaten by birds as well. And then beech, and most people don't know about this one. Um, it can be grown as a pretty good city tree. It's relatively slow growing, but it does produce a small nut on the inside that birds like nut hatches will make use of. All right, fruit. This isn't as common a food source for many birds. Um, most of them are grouped into just these four families. The one that makes use of fruit the most is the cedar waxwing in the middle. As adults, these birds are 90% of what we call frugivorous, which means they're fruit eaters. So they make good use of all the different fruit producing trees and shrubs that we have here in Michigan throughout the course of the late spring through early fall. But these other birds will also use fruit as food sources, especially during migratory season. In the fall, fruits are a great source of energy, not only from the sweet sugars that are in them, but some of our native fruits also are high in fats. And then if you have plants that have persistent fruits, fruits that stay on the bush or tree throughout the winter, birds like our robins and cardinals can make use of those. Um, I now live in Detroit across from Wayne State University. We have a lot of crab apple trees on campus and some hawthorns, and we have a resident robin population throughout the winter. 
because those crab apples have persistent fruit. It's not their favorite thing to eat, but it's what's available and they will stay here rather than risk migrating because they have a steady food source. There's a lot of different plants that produce fruits, but my A number one favorite is the service berry. Service berry is a small understory tree, which means in a woodland area, it would be growing beneath the bigger trees. So it's not very big, it's quite delicate. This time of year, it's just finishing up blooming with its little white open popcorn-like flowers. And pretty soon it's going to produce fruit. One of its other names is Juneberry. So you have an idea of when that fruit's around. That fruit is edible for people, it's delicious, and you'll never get any because the birds love it. It's one of the few things that's fruiting early in the summer and provides a great source for those parents frantically flying around trying to find enough food for their babies. So it gives them that energy boost they need. Um, it's a very attractive small tree. Not only does it have the beautiful white flowers in the spring, but in the fall, it has a range of autumn colors and you can grow it underneath larger trees in your backyard or in full sun. It's a great little tree. Chokeberry here on the far right has these dark berries. Um, they're not as tasty to people, hence the choke part of the word, but they are very attractive to birds. It is a relatively small, dense shrub um, and can be trimmed, you know, not with the big hedge clipper, you know, electric things like you would a privet hedge, but it can be trimmed to a nice shape has very attractive white flowers that then turn into these very attractive dark berries. And this is a great food source, especially for migratory birds in the late summer, early fall. Hawthorn is a good tree for persistent fruit. Um, and not only do those fruits stay on in the winter, which is a good um, aspect of the tree, but the tree is also a great nest space because it has thorns and predators aren't as likely to get in the tree after um, bird nests because of the thorniness of the tree. And then lastly, dogwoods and viburnums. Uh, dogwoods are both the tree that we're familiar with, but there are also many dogwood species that are shrubs and one bunchberry actually is a ground cover. And there are many species of viburnum. Some produce persistent fruits and others just fruit in the summer or early fall. So you have a wide variety of plants for fruits. You can also include the traditional things like raspberries and blackberries. I don't find birds eating those things quite as much, um, but there are a number of fruiting shrubs and trees that are good for the birds. All right, and everybody, right? They'll be migrating through pretty soon. And one of the first things that will be there available for them is the red wild columbine. Uh, I actually have wild columbine growing on Wayne State's campus right now. It's budding up. So it should start blooming right when those hummingbirds are coming through. So it's a really important food source for our migratory hummingbirds. And most of us think, well, hummingbirds, they like red, right? But they like other colors too. Red's an attractive color. Birds can see into that spectrum, part of the spectrum where insects cannot. But what hummingbirds are really looking for is those deep tubular flowers that are positioned on the plant in such a way that the hummingbird can hover and dip that beak and that long tongue deep into that flower and get nectar that's not available to most other organisms. Those deep tubular flowers are difficult for large bees like bumblebees. Um, sometimes they're accessible to small bees. Some wasps have gotten around the problem by biting at the base of the flower and taking the nectar from the side of the flower. But for the most part, these deep tubular flowers are a hummingbird's McDonald's. So whatever color you're looking for your yard and whatever kind of conditions you have, again, sun, shade, wet, dry, there's a plant for you that's good for hummingbirds. So we have our wild bergamot here in the upper middle area, that intense lavender color. It's a mint family member, so it's also good for us. We can make tea out of the leaves. To the right, we have great blue lobelia, which is a cousin to the red cardinal flower. Cardinal flower is kind of touchy to grow in most backyards, only lasts a few years, but the great blue lobelia cousin to that is much more persistent and a lot easier to grow in a variety of conditions. 
to the lower left, we have um, butterfly milkweed, but all the milkweeds are good nectar sources for hummingbirds. In the middle, this big bright pink spike, that's a Leatris or a blazing star. Uh, there are many different species. And not only are they hummingbird magnets, they're also butterfly magnets. All kinds of pollinators are attracted to Leatris and they are a beautiful plant in high summer. And then finally, in the lower right, we have my favorite hummingbird plant. This is jewelweed or touch me not. This is not an easy plant to grow and not very accessible because it is a wetland plant and it is one of Michigan's few native annual plants. So it grows from seed every year in moist soil. If you're lucky enough to have um, plants that have some native soil with them, if you've dug them up somewhere from a property that you have up north, or you've gotten them from a plant rescue sale like Cranbrook holds every year, you may be lucky enough to have some of those jewelweed seeds in that soil. Um, I actually do have that. So I'm very lucky here in Detroit. I have a pot and I have my little jewelweed coming up. Um, the other cool thing about jewelweed, it's a great medicine. You take the leaves, rub them into a pulp and put them on mosquito bites, the itch goes away. They're also supposed to be good for poison ivy. So it's an all around amazing plant, but it is blooming in August when the hummingbirds are heading south. So if you ever see a patch of this at that time of the year, you can be sure that it will be full of hummingbirds. Hummingbirds also make use of the holes drilled by this bird. This is a yellow-bellied sapsucker, and it is a member of the woodpecker family. But in the springtime, when it's migrating through, which is this time of the year right now, it's drilling these parallel holes into different kinds of trees. Then it flies away for a little while, and waits for the sap to collect in those holes, comes back and uses its tongue to collect the sap out of those holes. And when it's not watching, the hummingbirds also use the sap that's coming out of those holes. Um, some of its favorite trees are basswood, birch, and maple. It also used the old apple tree in my backyard back in Roseville. But if you see these lines of parallel in a tree, you know a sap sucker has been there and been busy. One word about hummingbirds before I forget. Hummingbirds not only thrive on nectar and sap, they also eat small insects. One of my favorite stories comes from Neil Diebold who is a native plant nurseryman. They had a big patch of a small shrub called New Jersey tea on their property that they were cultivating. And it's two to three feet tall, has these tiny little clusters of white flowers. And when it was in bloom, the hummingbirds would be all over it. And they couldn't figure out why. It doesn't have deep tubular flowers. It doesn't produce a lot of nectar. The hummingbirds wouldn't be able to get at it because the flowers are so tiny. And then they were watching what the hummingbirds were doing. The hummingbirds were picking up the small insects that were using the New Jersey tea as a pollen and nectar source. So hummingbirds do eat small insects and spiders as well. So you can also plant things that attract insects and the hummingbirds will make use of that as well. So as you can see, if you plant these things for the birds, they're not just for the birds. Our pollinators, moths, butterflies, bees, wasps will make use of these plants as well. Here are three flowers, um, honeysuckle in the upper right, wild bergamot in the lower right, and foxglove beard tongue on the left there. The hummingbird is using one, but we have a bumblebee using the penstemon, the foxglove beard tongue and a hummingbird clear wing moth using the wild bergamot. So what you plant for one will also work for others. And that's really important. So when you're planting these things in your yard, number one, you have to take into consideration the conditions that you have. Do you have full sun, part shade, full shade? Does it tend to be wet or dry? heavy clay soils or well-drained sandy soils? And then how are you going to construct this space for the birds? 
not only are you looking at food sources for them, but also shelter and nesting spaces. So take a look, what would the birds like to have? In woodland areas, you'll have layers. Herbaceous plants, grasses, ferns, and woodland wildflowers at the base level, then short shrubs, and then a little higher than that, you'll have um, understory trees, and then above that, your taller trees forming the canopy. And different birds like different areas in those trees. That's what we call niche partitioning. They may eat the same things, but they don't compete with one another because they're using different parts of that ecosystem as food sources. So think about that when you're constructing your space. Are you gonna go for a, a grassland area and make it more like a small prairie? What kind of birds would make use of that space? Think about your birds, think about your space, and think about what you can do to attract those birds in the space that you have. So this was part of my backyard in Roseville. Um, I had some staghorn sumac in here, uh, redbud as my lower um, understory plants. You can see my ground level here. I had blue stem goldenrod, some wood hyacinths, which were not native, but came with the property. Um, a lot of leaf litter on the ground, some evergreen plants in the background there. So this mix was very attractive to a wide variety of birds, including American woodcock in the middle of Roseville of all places, and many species of warblers, thrushes, thrashers, catbirds, all these need this kind of woodland-like space. And look at how small this space is. If you have a yard, you can do something like this in a relatively small space. Here was one of my favorites that used to make use of that space, an Eastern Tohi. I was always so excited when I saw those every year. I remember seeing my first one looking out my dining room window and I thought, wow, I've got a tohi here in my backyard. So again, if you plant it, they will come. And don't forget, weave some leaves. All right, so planting tips. First of all, think about what conditions you have. Don't try to change the conditions just because you want a certain plant. This wild lupin pictured here on the right needs sandy, infertile, well-drained soils. If you've got beautiful, moist garden soil, it won't like it at all. You might get to grow it for a year or two and then it's done. So the gardener mantra is right plant, right place. Know your conditions and match the plants to the conditions that you have. That's the best thing to do. If at all possible, avoid cultivars. These are plants in the horticultural industry that are designed for specific purposes. They breed them to have showy blooms or disease resistance. When they do that, sometimes they breed out the characteristics that these plants need to provide habitat for wildlife. So if at all possible, stay away from the Home Depots and the Lowe's. They get their plants from places other than Michigan. And those plants are adapted to places like North Carolina, where there's a lot of these nurseries, or the Pacific Northwest. They're not adapted to our Great Lakes region. So try and avoid those if at all possible. This other thing here that says plan, 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 that's something I had to learn the hard way. I just wanted to buy things and plant them in the yard. I was so excited about native plants and having as many different species as I could have. And I overstepped myself and had a lot of work to do. Start small, start with a plan, stick to the plan. And once that's underway and you've got that going and taken care of, then expand. But make sure um, you can try to reduce the weed pressure. So make sure that that is, you've taken care of the weeds as much as possible so they're not gonna compete with the plants that you're putting in. Again, thinking about your conditions and what will grow there and how you want to arrange it so that you've got the beauty that you enjoy, but also things there for the birds and the insects through different times of the year. And if at first you don't succeed with a native plant, well, yeah, try, try again. 
I've been attending a series of webinars this spring and the fellow that was running them has been using native plants for over 20 years in restoration and landscape use. And he said, you don't know a plant well until you've killed it three times. And he was right. It's not what you want to do, but it is a great way to get to know them better. So try them. It's okay. And here's an example of that. This is a strip behind the Biological Sciences Building at Wayne State University. It's about 400 feet long, about four and a half to five feet wide, and is sand and gravel. On the west side of it is an asphalt driveway, and on the other side of that driveway is the engineering building. To the east is the Biological Sciences Building. This is a hot, dry spot. The turf doesn't grow there, even though they keep trying. And so they let me play with it. And I said, okay, I know some native plants that'll grow in this kind of area. And this was the beginning of a garden at the back of the building. This has expanded quite a bit since this picture was taken. Uh, this year I have lupin seedlings coming up for the first time. And those yellow flowers there are sand coreopsis. Um, not long after this picture was taken, the goldfinches were in there eating the seeds in the middle of Detroit, in this terrible strip of land, um, bounded by asphalt and buildings, and they go having a party. So if you plant the right plants in the right place, they'll thrive and bring the birds in with them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about a few plants that you can have covering different, a different range of conditions. Uh, some species are so broad, there are so many species in that group that they can tolerate wet, dry, um, sunny, shady, they're tall, they're short. Asters and goldenrods have so many species that can tolerate a range of conditions. And they're extremely valuable plants because they bloom late in the season. And so they attract uh, migratory insects like these monarch butterflies. They're also the nectar and pollen source of last resort for a lot of our overwintering pollinator species like bees. So these are my two top choices for if you need a plant for just about any condition, the asters and goldenrods will have an example of that among their group. So you can find one there somewhere to fit your conditions. Most of our native plants are adapted to full sun. And some of my favorites are the silphiums. Uh, this is one silphium member called cup plant. It has those bright yellow flowers, produces large seeds. It's attractive to pollinators. The large seeds are great for goldfinches. They have a great time flinging them around. But the really cool thing about this plant is it's called cup plant because those leaves clasp the stem and form a small cup that holds water. And that's great for the insects and the birds. We're gonna be doing some research here on campus. We're planting cup plant in three different areas across campus. And one of our biologists is gonna be taking samples from the water to collect DNA from the organisms that visit these little cups to see what types of animals, insects, birds, and other species are visiting this plant to make use of that water source. So we're really excited to see what's going to come out of that research. A lot of our grasses are adapted to um, hot, side dry, hot, sunny, dry areas. Um, it's getting late in the evening here, like this prairie drop seed, an attractive ornamental plant, both in the summer and the fall, uh, short growing, very hardy, also relatively tolerant of some of our saltier conditions here along roadsides. So, and a great little plant for ground nesting birds and as a seed source in the late summer and early fall. You can also plant things in full to partial shade. And this would be mostly our woodland adapted plants. Um, what most of them do is grow and bloom here early in the spring before the trees fully leaf out. And then they go dormant later in the season. But there are plants like some goldenrods and asters that can thrive in almost total shade. A couple of my favorites, wild geranium is a great pollinator plant. 
So it will attract small insects for the birds to eat and can also be used um, a little bit as a nectar source by hummingbirds. This is that wild columbine that's gonna be blooming here shortly um, and providing nectar for our migratory hummingbirds. This is a plant that will tolerate partial to almost full shade, but also full sun and a range of conditions from wet to dry. So it's a pretty um, good plant all the way around for whatever conditions that you have. If you've got moist areas that stay wet during part of the year or a deliberate rain garden, there are some great plants for you there, especially things like this swamp or rose milkweed, another hummingbird plant, and of course, a food source for monarch butterfly caterpillars and the adults. Also host to a lot of other pollinating um, and nectar seeking insects. So a great plant for bugs. But mush is a small wetland shrub, great pollinator plant. So a lot of butterflies are attracted to this, um, but it can tolerate wet feet, which a lot of other woody plants cannot. It does not like to dry out though. So you'd have to have it someplace place that's consistently wet. Plants for dry areas, these plants typically have very deep root systems. Some of our native plants, up to two thirds of the plant growth is below ground. Some of them have roots that go as deep as 16 feet. And those aren't trees, they're just wildflowers. Of course, our Leatrice or Blazing Star is one of those plants. Um, there are some species that tolerate wet areas and others that tolerate places that are quite dry. And all of them give us these beautiful, bright, intense, pinkish purple um, flower spikes. They're great plants. Here's the New Jersey tea I was talking about earlier. You can tell those small white flowers aren't particularly attractive to hummingbirds, but the small insects that they attract are. So this is a great plant for uh, relatively dry areas. And again, it's a little shrub, stays quite small, about two to three feet. All right, so that was the whirlwind tour of native plants for birds. And since you're not going to remember all that, of course, I wanna provide you with some resources that you can go to to get the information that you need quickly and easily. And my A number one, best book for that. And yes, I prefer books. Websites are great, but I like to just be able to go to my shelf, pull something off and not have to worry about on a computer or using bandwidth on my phone. And I find all the information I need in one place. Birdscaping in the Midwest is designed specifically for this region. It's got um, a whole host of different scenarios. So a rock garden, a wet garden, a dry garden, a shade garden. It's got examples from different Midwestern states and it has nice sidebars in the different sections that have lists for the birds, even lists of the butterflies and the plants that can be used for them. Um, it's a fairly thick book, not very big, but it's packed with information. And it's pretty much the only thing that you will need if you want to garden for birds. If you want to get into some of the scientific background, um, Doug Tallamy's books, I mentioned him earlier. He's the entomologist that's been researching what plants um, support insects the best for our bird species to be eating and feeding to their young. So he's got a couple books out right now. He just came out with a third one. Bringing Nature Home was his first one, but the one that really speaks to the homeowner and why we should start transforming our backyards into habitat is nature's best hope. We've got wild areas that we've put aside, we have our parks, but we have all these suburban and urban areas that if we just nudge them a little more into being more natural and providing habitat for wildlife, we could have larger areas, corridors, clusters for the wildlife to use. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I'm here in the heart of Detroit, a block off of Wayne State's campus. I have a very tiny backyard that I share with the other members of my apartment complex. And I've seen things like winter wrens, common yellowthroat warblers here in my backyard during migratory season. 
because we have enough of a green space and starting to grow more native plants back here and they're finding them. They fly overhead, they see this space, they drop down and say, okay, this is a place I can find food and rest until I pick up and migrate to where I'm breeding. So those little places really help these birds and that's really important. If you wanna go onto the computer and look at things, Audubon has a native plant database that you can use. Um, if you're looking for specific conditions and you wanna narrow it down to the conditions that you have in your yard and find a list of plants that match those conditions, then that's the spot for you. Also visit your local nature center. Take a look around and see what kind of plants they have growing there in the natural areas that are near you and talk to the people that work there. They know what grows in your area and what will provide habitat for birds and insects. If you want to buy native plants, um, there is a group called the Native Michigan, the Michigan Native Plant Producers Association, MNPPA, um, and those list the nurseries that grow and provide native plants and seed. There aren't very many. Um, the closest one to where I am here in Detroit is in Ann Arbor. I usually go out toward Lansing to one of the larger nurseries there. They don't typically have a whole lot of retail um, time and space because they're more involved in things like restoration efforts, but that's where you're going to find your native plants. And they're typically native to Michigan because they are collected from seed from these remnant areas that I talked about. Um, seed from plants that are adapted to our conditions, our soils and our climate. So you can hope that they will grow in your space as well. But you'll be able to find those plants other places besides those nurseries. Um, other just general native plant gardening sites, the Springfield Township Vegetation Enhancement Project has an online database, but also a series of chapters that walk through the hows and whys of using native plants in a backyard setting. And if you're looking for a book instead, Planting Noah's Garden by Sarah Stein is a great book that talks about why and how to grow native plants in a backyard setting. If you're looking for sources of native plants, there's a bunch of sales coming up this time of the year. I'm a member of the St. Clair Shores Yardeners. Our sale is going to be in June. And right now we have an online pre-order form that this uh, slide links to, and you'll have access to that if you want to order some native plants from the Yardeners. Keep Growing Detroit down here in the city also has some different native plant species. And the Cranbrook Garden Auxiliary Native Plant Sale is coming up May 10th. Um, it's going to be completely online for the native plants. So you can just go to their site or the plants and then pick them up later in the week. There are many other local garden groups and nature centers that also host native plant sales. So check those out. They're all over the area here. Um, if you're interested in getting more involved in habitat gardening, the National Wildlife Federation has a great website for wildlife habitat gardening. It's very general. It's not entirely specific to your region, though they do have parts of it that are. And you can actually get a sign for your yard if you meet all of their criteria and be a wildlife habitat garden. So you can advertise to your neighbors what you're doing. You're not just growing a whole lot of weeds. You're actually doing something intentional and specific for wildlife. And we have a couple native plant organizations, uh, one that's national, the Wild Ones, and a local one, the Wildflower Association of Michigan, that help support uh, growers of native plants and offer educational programming. All right, and so that would be it for me. And now, Sarah, we can take questions because I'm sure folks have a lot of questions out there. All right, yes, they have been adding them into the chat. So the first one was, um, could you speak to flowers that are hybrids and are double petals and make it hard for pollinators to get into? Certainly. So hybrids are um, something we would consider a cultivar. This is a plant that's deliberately grown and bred for certain conditions. Um, some of these hybrids, these cultivars are bred to have double blooms. So that means instead of just one set of petals around the central part of the flower, they'll have multiple layers of that. You'll see that in a lot of our hybrid roses, um, some of the zinnias. So they're so dense with all of these petals that pollinators can't get into 
the central portion of the flower where the nectar and pollen are. And sometimes those structures aren't even there. They're bred out of these plants. So those types of plants are not accessible to insects. Um, and if those reproductive structures are bred out of the plant, they don't even produce seeds for birds to eat or anybody else. So those are ones to avoid. So if you remember the cone flowers that I had pictures of, they just have that row of petals around the, the base and that central portion where the um, seeds would be forming. Those are the kind of flowers that you want to go for, um, where you can actually see how the, the birds can get in or the pollinators can get in to get the nectar and pollen that they need. So I hope that answers oh, that great. question. Thank that addresses you. That. Yes. Um, and along those lines, um, someone asked, how do you know which plants are cultivars? Usually with a cultivar, you will see the Latin name, the genus and the species. And then after that, it might have an X and another species name. That means it's a crossbreed between two species. Or you meet, might see VAR period, which means it's a variety of that species. Typically, the natives will just have their genus and species name. That's it. Um, that's not always entirely true, but it's a pretty good way to start out looking for um, native plants. Most of your garden centers and um, the hardware stores that carry garden plants don't have truly native Michigan or Great Lakes region genotype. And that means plants that have been here historically, that have the genetic structure that's adapted to our conditions. Again, most of those places typically get their bulk plants from places like North Carolina and the Pacific Northwest. So they may be native, but they're not native to this region. And so not as well adapted to our conditions or our wildlife. Great, thank you for that explanation. Um, and you already went over places to get native plants, but someone was asking um, if you knew of any, particularly in Southwest Michigan. Southwest Michigan in Kalamazoo, um, Savannah, no, what's he called there? I haven't been out there. I know there's a grower in um, the Kalamazoo area and I know his first name, but I don't <laughs> know him. Let's see if I can, oops, it won't let me access the MMPPA site. But if you go to that site, um, once you have the, the slides that Sarah will send you and the other resources Sarah will send you, you can look up um, plant producers that are in your area. And you can also look for sales from the different garden groups that might be in your area. Um, the Wild Ones National Group has many local chapters. So if you go to the Wild Ones site, you can look for um, a chapter in your region and see if they have native plant sales as well. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we have someone saying, I'm in the middle of planting my garden with numerous plant varieties with similar soil and sun requirements, but slightly different drought tolerances. Do you have any tips on irrigation methods, watering intervals, et cetera? I try and plant things that don't need to be watered. <laughs> Normally when I establish plants, I will do it in the fall. Um, natives are best established in the fall because that way you can get them into the ground, they can start to get rooted and then they can go dormant. So you don't have to worry about watering them. Uh, of course, all the plant sales are in the spring this time of the year. So you're gonna buy them, you're gonna stick them in the ground and you're gonna spend the summer watering them. For native plants, if they're drought tolerant, you probably only have to water them to get them established once every few days, depending on how hot and sunny it is and depending on how much natural rainfall we have and how moist your soil is. Um, I try and water as little as possible. And you wanna irrigate close to the ground as much as possible so you don't have the water um, evaporating from the air and from the soil. I also try to avoid using mulch, but if you need to, that helps keep the moisture in. So go ahead and use that if you need to use it. But we try and plant here as densely as possible so that we don't need to or plant things that are highly drought tolerant. All right. 
Excellent. And then it looks like a couple of people found that nursery um, hidden Savannah. Ah, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Hidden Savannah, Kalamazoo. Yay Thank you, folks. Google. Um, <laughs> and then the last question I have here, it looks like, and there's a lot of other ideas in the chat. So hopefully people are checking those out. But um, do rose hips provide any benefit? Yes, they do. As long as they are fleshy enough for the birds to eat. Uh, some of the rose hips from uh, cultivars, uh, number one, some cultivars don't produce rose hips um, because they can't be pollinated. But our native roses do produce pretty fleshy rose hips. Um, it's not a favorite thing for the birds because the outer part of the hip is quite tough. But it can be a good winter food source because with all of the frost and and thawing, it tends to soften that outer husk and makes the fruit within the hip a little more accessible to birds. So um, birds like robins will eat them in the winter time. Great, thank you. We have one more question that popped up, which is a good one, I think. Um, can you speak to how people can integrate native plants in suburbs with HOAs or in places where appearance is important? Not everyone can have a prairie in front of their yard. Right. So there are a lot of native plants that are very attractive and much more like the cultivars that we're used to. Think of purple coneflower. That's an easy one right off the bat. Um, a near native, maybe a native to Michigan, um, but definitely one that will produce uh, nectar and pollen for our small insects and butterflies, but then of course produce seed for birds like our goldfinches. So you can find some very nice, compact, showy plants. Um, great blue lobelia is one of my favorites for most small gardens, not a very big plant. Lovely blue colored flowers. One of the things to do is uh, talk to folks at the native plant sales. For the St. Clair Shores Yardeners one, um, I come up with a list of plants and then I also produce a culture guide to go with it that talks about where these plants are good in a small suburban or urban backyard, um, sun, shade, how big they are, which plants to avoid, which plants would be best to plant in those situations. Um, the book here, Birdscaping in the Midwest, is really great because they do have a couple sections that focus on smaller yards and examples of those. And again, um, chapters of the Wild Ones Native Plant Organization here on the last page. Um, if you find a local chapter, you can talk to the members of that organization to find out what works best in your area. Um, these are folks that grow native plants and have fun doing them in typical, usually suburban gardens. So you can integrate them in with other things quite easily. As I mentioned earlier, I'm here in Detroit. I have a small backyard that I share with the other people in my apartment complex. My landlord has graciously allowed me to put in some native plants. So I have tall coreopsis, I have uh, foxglove beard tongue, which is a beautiful compact little plant that tolerates a really wide range of conditions. On campus, I have things like zigzag goldenrod growing in the shade, uh, wild columbine. If you have a little more space, maybe something taller and more prominently showy like uh, showy goldenrod. Swamp or rose milkweed is the best milkweed for small garden areas because of the range of conditions that it tolerates. If you have well-drained soil, you can grow its cousin, butterfly milkweed, um, in drier spaces. And that's a very small, compact plant with bright orange flowers. So the other thing you can do is you know, go look at those nurseries and garden shops, see if you can find things that have a native plant equivalent um, see what you like and see if you can find the native genotype variety of that plant. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That's all our questions. We've had a lot of people thanking you. We, I, I learned so much every time that you join us. So thank you so much, Michelle. And sure. thank you everyone for being here tonight. And folks are welcome to reach out um, to me. Uh, the first slide has a link to the Detroit Biodiversity Network, which is a student group we run on campus growing native plants. Um, but yeah, uh, Sarah, if you want to provide my contact information, I will be happy to answer people's questions as well. Let's see, where's the chat here? 
I can drop my email address into the chat. Oh, great. Thank you so much. And I'll, uh, it'll also be, I'll send out the recording from this webinar, as well as all the resources that Michelle talked about, and I'll include her email in there as well. Yep. Um, so that you can reach out as you think of new questions. <laughs> great. Which yep. I want to be the Johnny Appleseed of native plants. So <laughs> please perfect, reach perfect. out to me and ask. <laughs> um, well, thank you everyone. Have a great evening. We will be uh, here next month in May. We have a couple webinars, um, one on peregrine falcons in Michigan something else I know Michelle loves and is a part yep. of. Um, Come visit and, our webcam here at Wayne State. <laughs> right. And then we also have a wildlife photography webinar at the end of May. So we will keep these coming and um, check out your, on our Facebook page or our website or our Flyway Express e-newsletter um, and reach out if you don't get any of those and are interested. Um, thank you again. Everyone have a wonderful night. Thanks folks. Hope you learned something and got it. Got something you can do now in your yard. Thanks for coming tonight. <laughs>